Hello and welcome. You're watching News Central TV. It's time for news now. I am Judith TV. Top stories at this hour. Former Nigeria's aviation minister, Hadi Sirika, granted bail over alleged 2.5 billion Naira fraud. Human Rights Watch warns of genocide in Sudan. Seven villagers killed in deadly rebel attack in DR Congo. Details shortly. And we begin the news at this hour in Nigeria, where its former Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, has been granted a hundred million naira bill by the Federal Capital Territory High Court sitting in the Maitama area of Abuja. Sirika, who pleaded not guilty to a six-count charge brought against him by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, is being accused of granting undue advantage to his sister, to his daughter, I beg your pardon, and her husband over the controversial Nigeria Air startup. He was arraigned with his daughter, Fatima Hadi Sirika, his son-in-law, Jalal Hama, and a company named Al Durak Investment Limited before Justice Sivanos Origi of the FCT High Court in Maitama. Our correspondent, Imano Bogudu, covered the court proceedings and will give us more update now. A very good day to you, Emmanuel. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Fantastic. Yeah. Give us, give us uh, the situation update at the court this morning. What happened all through uh, during the proceedings? Yeah, what happened first uh, was the fact that uh, Hadi Sirika, the former Minister of Aviation, was arraigned along, alongside his daughter and his son-in-law. Sirika and his daughter were uh, were docked, and, and and the son was also uh, the son-in-law was also in court. So they were arraigned, and then their charges, about six count charges, was read to them, of which of which they pleaded not guilty to any of them. Right. Uh, so give us more details on on, on uh, in terms of information on what these charges were, just to be more detailed. As they were arraigned in court, what were the charges in particular? Most of the charges revolves around the Nigeria Air alleged scam which is about 2.5 billion naira. Uh, to start with, uh, Arik Sirika has been accused by the EFCC for granting the consultancy of the Nigeria Air startup to a company which belongs to him, allegedly, uh, named, named Tenoro. Of course, uh, that, uh, the money was alleged to be around 1.3 billion naira. That's for the startup of the Nigeria Air. Then no. another charge that has to do with his office has to do with uh, where the FCC alleged that he granted undue advantage to, uh, to his daughter and his son-in-law, where he gave them a contract of the uh, apron expansion of the Katina Airport, which is around the sum of 1.2 billion naira as well. They pleaded not guilty to all the charges. Did his counsel say anything about the bail granted by the court? And was there any specifics on where he will be till the bail terms are met? You know, whether the EFC, whether it's going to be the EFCC facility or the Kuja prisons? Of course, the Kuja prison, if he cannot meet up with the bail conditions. Right now, and he's currently in court. He's actually going around, you know, the different offices trying to make sure that he meets up with this uh, bail condition. Because the strict instruction from Justice Sylvanus Oji was the fact that if he cannot just get those two shorties with 100 million naira each and must have properties in Abuja, if he cannot, he cannot meet them before the close of work today, he should be taken to the correctional center. Many thanks, Emmanuel. We'll, we'll could definitely keep our eyes on this story and get back to you with, with uh, more development. For many thanks again. We'll move on now to the Nigerian presidency, where it is said that the cybersecurity levy was introduced to tackle cyber crimes and terrorism. It said the nation lost over 273 billion naira to cyber crime alone in 2022. It also claimed that the same levy is in place in Ghana and Rwanda. Opposition to the policy grew on Wednesday with the Trade Union Congress ex Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi and the coalition of northern groups rejecting it. 
The TUC, in a statement signed by its president, Festus Osifo, slammed the directive by the CBN to banks imposing a 0.5% cybersecurity levy on almost all electronic transactions. The union said it is disturbed that since the inception of the President Bola Tinubu led administration, government policies have brought pain, anguish, and sorrow to Nigerians. And now to discuss this, I'm joined by an information and technology analyst, Timmy Tayo Okumbo Yujo. Uh, Timmy Tayo, a very uh, good morning to you, or rather good afternoon. Let's quickly get started because we're pressed for time. How will the implementation of the cybersecurity level? impact the operational costs and profitability of banks and you know financial institutions in Nigeria so to be so, so thank you very much uh, to begin with the implementation of that levy already shows an ignorance of the cyber security and the cyber crime environment because what the government really needs to be doing first is to provide some guidance as to how organizations individuals and even government parastatals themselves would keep themselves secure i.e how they would maintain a low risk environment. So um, to start with um, levying Nigerians, as far as I'm concerned, it's just another way of the government trying to make money out of, uh, you know, out of, out of people's unawareness of what the true risks are for the Nigerian nation. Uh, Timmy Tayo, they have, I mean, the presidency have said that this uh, levy is not a new thing. And when you think about it in an international standard or even in the African continent, it's been done in Ghana and Rwanda as well. As, and so it begs to ask, to what extent does the you know, cybersecurity levy align with international standards and best practices when it comes to uh, cybersecurity taxation? Okay, so to begin with, um, as far as I know, every organization that tries to... Uh, comply to best practice and recommended uh, countermeasures against uh, cyber, uh, cyber crimes would start with providing a set of standards or guidelines. So for example, um, the, in, in the US, you have uh, an organization called the National, um, National uh, oh God, I forgot, it, it's an acronym. It's called uh, NIST is the, is the acronym. I forgot what the full meaning is. And then also you've got the international standard organization that covers Europe. And then you've got uh, the NCSC, uh, which would be the National Center for uh, Security Countermeasures, NCSC. So, and what those organizations would do to begin with would be to provide guidelines. They would provide standards. They would provide those best practices that you mentioned so that organizations, individuals know what they have to do, what kind of safeguards they have to put in place. That's the place to start. So our government, as usual, are being clever by half by citing countries like Ghana, like Rwanda, who by and large are more or less just like us. So the guidance that people need to follow, like where, where do people look to? How do I know to keep myself safe? What are the risks that are out there? Who are the attack, you know, who are the threat actors? How do I learn all this stuff? This should be the beginning. So in essence, the government is saying that um, uh, because uh, cyber crimes are sort of um, increasing, uh, they are going to go and charge a levy in order to protect us. It's almost like saying because um, we have uh, insecurity issues in Nigeria, therefore we're going to make people pay Addition, some kind of taxation in order to give more money to the to the Nigerian army. It just doesn't add up. And you know, citing Ghana or Rwanda as examples is a very, very, very poor attempt at giving legitimacy to what is turning out to be very ill thought and ignorant of what the real risks are. Hmm. So, with exemptions at line for certain types of transactions, as we've seen, uh, what kind mm -hmm. of criteria will be used to determine? you know, being eligible for, for these exemptions. And how would this be monitored and even enforced by regulatory authorities? So so that's another interesting thing. Um so I've gone and read the I've gone and read the um the circular provided by the CVN a couple of times. There are like eight um exceptions, like you know, reasons why you wouldn't have to pay the fee. Uh but then in, also in addition to that, I think someone provided um, someone provided uh, an explanation as regards how the money 
uh, or who the money would be remitted to. So it sounds like the CBN is going to act as middleman and re remit the money to the Nigerian uh, security agency. So this, to be honest, sounds like just another security vote. So you know how security votes are unaudited uh, and given to governors. You know, you, it's it's unaccountable. Nobody can nobody can go and request any kind of transparency as to how the monies are spent. It feels to me like this is just um, quote and unquote a security vote for the National Security Agency. And you know, I I wouldn't have any problem if. Um, if we are if we are being told that for reasons of security that this money can be audited, the way that it's been implemented and the and the explanations given to the reason why this levy has to be implemented is a complete ignorance, you know, of again of what the risks are because it's not only the financial environment that are exposed to. So the risk of cyber terrorism. I don't want to mention. I don't want to give people any ideas, which is why I wouldn't mention other sectors, other sectors that are really, really important and critical that the government needs to be looking at securing as regards um, cyber terrorism and cyber risks. Hi, uh, Tamir Tayo. Many thanks for coming on. We appreciate you for just giving more insights on this uh, developing story. Appreciate you for doing this with us. Thank you for having me. You're watching News Now on New Central TV. We'll take a short break. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. And we continue the news, and this time with security. A recent poll report released by International Polling Agency, the NOI polls, has confirmed earlier reports indicating that over 6 billion naira was paid in ransom between July 2021 and June 2022. The report indicates that majority of the cases of kidnapping in the country occurs in the northern region, while many attribute the cause of kidnapping to the lack of jobs and poor economic situation in the country. Amadi Uyi reports. The findings released by the NOI polls saw six out of ten adult Nigerians say government is not doing enough to curb the menace of kidnapping in the country. The NOI poll says that the poll sampled the opinion of citizens to know what they think are the prevalence of kidnapping and what can be done to reduce insecurity where they live. One of the things that we tried to do was to ask people if they feel um, the prevalence of kidnapping is high in their locality, again, specifically in their locality. And we had about 53% of Nigerians that said that the prevalence of kidnapping was high. And then we went further to ask whether they know specifically, personally, someone that has been kidnapped within the past one year. 28% believe that the solution is, is tackling insecurity. So the perception of Nigerians made available to government, uh, which is something that gives a lot of value to this work that NOIPO does, is that tackling insecurity is the direct solution to the national food crisis that we have. The poll results, however, revealed that majority of the cases of kidnapping in the country occur in the north, with the north central zone accounting for the highest number of respondents who decried the prevalence of the menace. Security experts here think this is a worrisome situation. When you look at the region where the major concerns are, either the North Central, the North East, or the North West, these are a big part of the country where we are talking about agriculture. And so if the people in those regions can no longer go to farm and live a normal life, then we are in trouble. If we go deeper into this threat factor, kidnap for ransom, uh, at least based on my, the findings by Beacon Consulting, 80% of the incidents that we're monitoring are happening in the northern part of the country. So if we're able to improve the security situation, reduce kidnap for ransom in the northern part of the country, would have reduced 80% of the prevalence. While citizens give differing views on the reasons for kidnapping, however, experts here want their issues addressed. When we ask people what they think were the main causes of the increase in kidnapping, the major thing that they pointed out to was um, unemployment, and um, oh, unemployment was one of the um, main, main drivers. And consequently, the recommendation was for government to 
um, fix the economy, improve, um, find, create jobs, and that. But there were just a few mention of community policing as one of that, um, one of the instances. With a poll indicating that about 56% of adult Nigerians believe that not enough is being done to curb the menace, clearly government has much work to do to change public perception of its efforts. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Protesters in Abuja have demanded the release of Nigerian journalist Daniel Ojuku following his arrest by the police seven days ago. This was as they converged on the police force headquarters in Abuja. They said his detention violates the nation's administration of Criminal Justice Act and is an attempt to stifle press freedom. News Center's Joshua Imarayi was at the scene and brings us more details. Joshua, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Or rather, I should say good afternoon. Uh, Joshua, can you give us an update on what transpired at the scene of the protest? Well, uh, protesters were uh, on ground as early as 9 a.m. this morning, and they barricaded the entrance of the force headquarters of the Nigerian police force. One of the grievances were that the continuous detention of Daniel Ojuku from Lagos. They, they, they described it, they, they describe it, they described the the arrest as a Gestapo manner, which in which um, his rights were trampled upon, and he was abducted without due process being followed. Hmm. And did the police give any reason for the continued detention of uh, of Daniel Ojuku? Well, they said, they, they, according to the police um, commissioner of police for federal operations, he said that Daniel Ujuku was arrested uh, for a case of cyber crime and um, uh, trampling upon someone's cyber um, civil rights on um, online on, online platforms as well. Mm. One of the reasons why why he was arrested was that he was accused of publishing a story on the special advisor or special assistant rather to the president on. SDG at Ejoke at Fulure, and according to the uh, office of the SDG, they described the report as false. So, what specific demands did the, the protesters request? They are currently urging the president of the, the Republic of Nigeria and the IGP to immediately release Daniel Ojuku and reinstate his fundamental human rights. They say they say this act is a a gross violation of his fundamental human rights, and the arrest was conducted in an uncivil manner without following due process. They were insisting that as such, he, he needs to be released immediately. And subsequently, when such arrests are to be made, there should be a clear and concise, clear and concise way of doing it. They, are, they requested that whenever such arrest is to be made, that it should be duly signed by the legal representative of the Nigerian police force. And Proper invitation should be made inviting these persons to the police. Hmm. So if, if the police leadership refuses to listen to their demands, what then did they say is the next step you know, for the protesters or the group? These protesters have said that they are reaffirming their stance that if Daniel Ojuku is not released, their continuous onslaught will continue. They say that if Daniel Ojuku is not released in the forthcoming days, that the protests will continue, that this is just a beginning of series of protests to reprimand the police of this current act. Uh, many thanks to you, Joshua. We'll keep our eyes on the story as it continues to unfold. Well, many thanks again. We'll move now to politics, where the Federal High Court in Abuja has halted efforts by the People's Democratic Party to remove Umar Damagum as acting national chairman. The court order, delivered on May 3rd with documents made available to journalists on Wednesday, prevented the PDP from appointing a replacement for Damagu until a full hearing on the matter can take place. This decision comes amid internal party uh, tensions leading up to the PDP's National Executive Council meeting in April. Some party members had called for Damagu's removal to pave the way for a permanent chairman. Senator Umar Maina and Zana Gandama uh, filed a lawsuit challenging this move. The defendants, including the PDP, its governing bodies, and the Independent National Electoral Commission. Now, the next hearing is scheduled for May 14th. 
Now to state politics, but this time in River State, the member representing Boni constituency in the River State House of Assembly, Honorable Victor Okojombo, has emerged as the new Speaker of the House, loyal to the state governor of Ubarra. Now this latest development might be a response to the Opposition or Progressives Congress directive to the 27 Assembly members to impeach Governor Fubara. Oku Jombo takes over from the former factional Speaker of the House, Right Honorable Edison Ehi, who resigned as both Speaker and Member of the House on December 31st, 2023. In the meantime, Nigeria's main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, has condemned the call for the impeachment of the governor of River State by the state chairman of the All Progressives Congress, APC. The party's national publicity secretary, while speaking with newsmen in the nation's capital, Abuja, says that those directed to carry out the impeachment process are illegally parading themselves as members of the State House of Assembly. He adds that they have no constitutional power to exercise the impeachment process and urged the Inspector General of Police to call the APC State Chairman to order, saying that the call is an attempt by the APC to forcefully overthrow a democratically elected governor. The PDB therefore draws the attention of the Inspector General of Police to the subversive utterances of the APC chairman in River State, which is capable of triggering crisis and derailing the democratic order in the country. The APC must perish. And I emphasize the word perish. It will perish the thought of forcefully taking over River State. As such, it's a direct assault on the sensibility of the people which will be resisted firmly. The APC chairman in River State should come to terms with the fact that River State is home to PDP and that the people of River State are not ready to pull their destiny in the hands of a corrupt, oppressive, and anti-people special purpose vehicle. Earlier, a stockholder in Port Harcourt City Project, Takana Bosi, shared his thoughts on the news. Take a look. As a peaceful coexistence between the former governor of River State, which, who is now the FCC minister, um, yes, from Wiki, and the governor of River State, crumbled the news of, of impeachment process against the governor, you know, and it's, it's, it's spread like a fire, you know, the, his offense is still not known up till, up till now. And, um, it is well known that the illegal 27 assembly members who, who claim to, to call themselves assembly members are not functional. Hence, there needs to be a leadership in the legislative. That's the reason um, for Oko Jumbo emerging as the new speaker of the State House of Assembly, which, that, which was done well. And now to health matters. The Nigeria Red Cross says that in 2024 alone, over 30 million citizens will suffer from hunger. The Red Cross made this known while marking the World Red Cross Day in Abuja, calling on citizens and government to extend a hand of support to those desperately in need of aid. Amadi Uyi reports. The Nigeria Red Cross joined the international community to mark the World Red Cross Day. The Red Cross says that with conflicts and disasters increasing worldwide, the work of its volunteers is already cut out for them. Nigerian society remains the number one volunteer organization in this country in alleviating the suffering of the vulnerable people wherever it may be found. Our network of volunteers spam across the 774 local governments of this country in the 36 states and the federal capital territory. We have over 800,000, nearly a million volunteer network in this country. Together with the Nigerian Red Cross Society, the International Committee of the Red Cross work in the Northeast to reconnect, reconnect families separated due to the conflict, promote health and hygiene, best practices, and train mothers and caregivers to identify malnutrition and respond to it. We've been working in Nigeria with Nigerians for over 100 years now, as you heard, since 1917. So we look together with the Nigerian Red Cross, we look back at the long partnership, and we're committed 
to remain in Nigeria. It adds that the World Red Cross Day presents an opportunity to inflict and consider the well-being of its volunteers. You cannot do very well if the hand feeding the sick is also sick. Then the ability to handle it will be impossible. And therefore, keeping humanity alive makes us look at our volunteers of various cadres, including the likes of me standing here, that while you are using them to take care of bad situations, let us also see how we can also take care of them to be alive in order to take care of those we need to be alive. The Red Cross also raised an alarm over the projected number of vulnerable Nigerians that will suffer from hunger in 2024, saying there is a need to prepare to reach out to them. This year, more than 30 million people are going to be hungry in this country. Let me repeat that. 30 million people are going to be hungry in this country. But there are 207 or 170 million other Nigerians that can help other Nigerians. Why are we not standing up? We must and we should. And let's show the rest of the world that the Nigerians do believe in humanity and are keeping it alive. The Red Cross called on citizens, private and public organizations, including the federal and state governments, to support humanitarian efforts aimed at reaching out to the poor and needy, desperately in need of aid. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Stakeholders across the country are calling for critical reforms and investment in Nigeria's health and social sector, saying this will guarantee a secured path to a long-term sustainable development in the country. This was as they converged on the nation's capital, Abuja, for the 2024 Nigeria Development and Finance Forum. New Central's Joshua Imarai completes the story. In a move to catalyze economic growth and drive positive social change, the Nigeria Development and Finance Forum convened leaders from diverse sectors to discuss strategies that can reposition Nigeria for success in coming years. Under the theme, The Road to Economic and Social Welfare Transformation, the conference delved into key factors that must be addressed to achieve broad-based growth and sustainable development. There's a need for a lot of policy attention on the domestic environment, and the support structure for this economy has, at this time, to be inward-focused. And we also believe very strongly that there is the need to get citizens to believe once again that Nigeria will rise. Experts here agree that Nigeria's youthful population form the fulcrum of the nation's workforce. They say investing in their education and growth is vital for a healthier and more prosperous future. They say this is the way to go if Nigeria hopes to build a thriving economy that benefits all citizens. It's very good evidence that a healthier and more educated population, the more a country is healthier and more educated, the more the likelihood that that country will have sustainable and more equitable socioeconomic development. And healthier populations are more impressive attractors of foreign drug investment because foreign drug investment is unlikely to go into a population that is unhealthy. To boost the economy through industrialization, the recommended a strategic shift in mindset, emphasizing the need for a proactive and innovative approach to drive growth and development. To have a good economy, you must industrialize. To industrialize, you must have good regulatory agencies. Uh, to have good regulatory agencies, there must be a good governance. Good governance, strong governance, strong leadership. Without changing mindsets, without changing mindsets at the management level. We'll just be going round and round and round. Stakeholders say cooperation across multiple levels of government is fundamental and important and calls for more focus on the productive sectors of the economy. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. Watching news now on New Central TV coming up.
Human Rights Watch warns of a genocide in Sudan. We'll bring you details after the break. Don't go anywhere. Now we continue the news in West Africa, where Benin's President Patrice Talon issued a stern demand on Wednesday urging Niger's uh, military rulers to cooperate and reopen their border if they wish to resume crude exports through Benin's uh, summit port. Talon's call comes amid easing trade restrictions on Benin's side of the border following sanctions imposed on Niger after a coup last July that ousted President Mohamed Bazoum. Now, however, the President Talon expressed uh, frustration accusing Niger's military leaders of treating Bene as an enemy and failing to collaborate in restoring ties and formalizing trade agreements. The landlocked nation of Niger relies on a pipeline connecting its oil fields to Bene's cement port on the Atlantic coast for exporting its crude oil. European Union Ambassador to Senegal Jean-Marc uh, Passini has assured that the EU has nothing to hide regarding the list of fishing license holders in the country. Now, this comes after Senegalese authorities took a significant step towards transparency by publicly releasing a list of boats authorized to fish in its waters, aiming to promote the responsible management of natural resources. However, the move comes amid growing frustrations among Senegalese fishermen who have voiced concerns about the impact of foreign trawlers on their livelihoods. Many local argue that the influx of these vessels equipped with advanced technology has led to a decline in fish stocks, driving up prices in the local market. And also South Africa, Clover, a branded consumer goods company in South Africa, says it has revoked its halal as certification on products that are linked to Israel due to the injustice and the ongoing genocide in uh, Palestine uh, by Israel. The General, the General Industrial Workers Union has expressed its concern. The union says the step by Clover uh, rises uh, issues that demand attention and action as many workers will lose their jobs. The union says the beverage and food brand should consider disinvestment as the solution. And now to discuss this further, I'm joined by President General Industries Workers Union of South Africa, Mametwe Sibiyi. Uh, many thanks for jo joining us. Uh, let's get started, shall we? Uh, Clover will no longer certify products from companies that are linked to Israel as halal. Uh, will this affect thousands of, of Clover workers? So let's be clear. It is the Muslim Judicial Council Halal Trust that has cancelled a certificate, um, a certification of all Clover products as halal. And, and I think the reason for that is because, um, you know, since 2018, uh, Clover, which is the biggest dairy manufacturer in South Africa, was taken over by Milko, an Israeli-owned company operating in illegal Jewish settlements on Palestinian land. And for that, they've withdrawn the certificate um, of uh, certification of all its products as halal. And this is something that we objected as a union when the takeover of Clover took place in 2018. We said in, we cannot, especially as a country, um, that comes out of apartheid, uh, as a democracy that benefited from international solidarity, stand idly and accept a takeover of the major dairy manufacturer in this country by a Zionist company that is complicit um, in the crime of colonization um, on racist and national oppression of the Palestinian people on the siege of, you know, of Gaza, which is now escalating into genocide. We cannot be in good conscience here with a company that um, is, you know, complicit in the brutal military occupation of West Bank and, of course, apartheid inside um, 1948 Israel itself. So for that, we've taken protests against the company uh, two years ago, six month protests on that issue, but also against the job losses that took place ever since this takeover. Right. 
So according to Clover, right, they are doing this to stand in solidarity with the people of, you know, Palestine. But what do you suggest that they do instead of revoking the, the certificates? It is not Clover. As I said, it's a Muslim judicial council that is canceling a certificate of Clover products. So, yes, they are doing that in solidarity with the people of Palestine. We ourselves stand in solidarity, absolute unwavering solidarity with people of Palestine who are fighting oppression. And we have participated in Palestinian solidarity movement. Our position is that the question and the struggle of the people of Palestine today is the single most revolutionary factor in the world political situation, in a struggle against world imperialism. And the victory of the struggle will not only be a major blow against you know, world imperialism, Western imperialism in particular, in which Zionism is a major factor, but actually will be a major victory and inspiration for all the oppressed people everywhere fighting to shake the yoke of imperialism here in South Africa, in Nigeria, and everywhere across the world, which um, is part of the world that really is oppressed by, you know, Western and, of course, world imperialism and capitalism. Therefore, we stand in solidarity um, with the struggle against um, the siege of Gaza and now to oppose um, the, the, the genocide. We demand ceasefire, but also we demand a free, independent Palestine. Right. So... Let's put this into context, right? How many people are at risk of losing their jobs? And, and what steps are you taking as, as a union to make sure that, you know, those workers don't lose their jobs, the, the numbers? So we are almost certain that um, despite not being responsible um, for this uh, or the action that led to this boycott, if anything, having opposed the takeover of Clover by... By, 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 by Merkel, and of course, amongst other submissions that we made, we cited the inevitability, inevitability of the boycott, right? And the risk it will place on the company in terms of its sustainability and the jobs. We are almost certain that the company and its management will try to offload the burden uh, of this crisis um, on the working class, on the workers, on our members, and as a union, we are ready to defend them. Just as we have defended massive job losses that resulted from the takeover. When the company was taken over by, uh, by Merkel, what then happened is that despite their promises and undertaking to government and before the Competition Commission, um, thousands, approximately about 3,000 workers lost their jobs, right? Uh, six, if not more, factories were closed with devastating impacts on the local economies, on the farmers, and of course, the local communities where these operations were located, because in some of the instances, most of these operations were actually the central economic activities in many of these small towns across the country. Amawe. And that's the reason we've called for divestment um, of Milko from Clover. We have called for nationalization of Milko of Clover on the basis of democratic control and management of the working class to ensure that it becomes transformed from cooperate profiteering entity into a public ownership that can provide an so, affordable food so and dairy products for starving South Africans, particularly in the context of food inflation and the rising cost of living. So, V, many thanks for coming on, and we'll continue to follow the story as it unfolds. We appreciate you for doing this with us. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. And we move on to East Africa, where Human Rights Watch is rising serious alarms about the violence unfolding in Sudan's Dafo region. The organization alleges that recent attacks by paramilitary forces could constitute genocide against non-Arabic ethnic groups. According to HRW, the Rapid Support Forces, a Sudanese paramilitary group along with allied militia, have been carrying out a brutal campaign in Darfur since the war with the regular army began in April of 2023. The war has already claimed tens of thousands of lives, with UN experts estimate, estimating up to 15,000 deaths in the West Darfur town of Al Janina uh, alone. HRW accuses RSF and their allies of a deliberate campaign targeting ethnic Masalit uh, communities. 
And in Central Africa, seven villagers were killed and six others injured in an attack blamed on the M23 rebel group and on Wednesday in South Kivu province, according to local officials. The attack comes amid reports of clashes near Saik, a strategic town in northern, or rather neighboring north uh, Kivu. The M23 rebels, led by Tusis, have gained control of significant territory in north Kivu over the past two years and appear to be expanding their operations. This renewed conflict comes after eight years of relative peace. The M23 rebels re-emerged in late 2021 and have since tightened their grip around Goma, North Kivu's capital. The Democratic Republic of Congo accuses neighboring Rwanda of backing the M23, a claim Rwanda has denied. And now to sports. Peace seems to be gradually returning to Fakafut as President Samuel Eto'o finally approved the appointment of Mark Beres as the chair or rather the coach of the indomitable Lions. Cameroon football witnessed confusion in the last few months and the Minister of Sports Nasser Kumbi and the executive of Fakafut met to resolve the challenges. Eto'o agreed with the appointment of Bryce but changed the back room. The country's football body announced Chiachim Munuga and Giannis Zilirus in place of Francis Oman Beek and Carlos Camini to replace Alem Baca as the goalkeeper trainer. Eight players have been nominated for the 2023-2024 Young Players of the Season Award. Newcastle's striker Alexander Isak, who was nominated for the award last term after an impressive maiden campaign at St. James Park since joining Real Sociedad, features on an eight-man shortlist, which includes Manchester City peer Erling Haaland and Phil Foden. Has Arsenal duo, and that's uh, Bukayo Saka and William Saliba, Cole Palmer of Chelsea, Manchester United's Kobe Mino, and Destiny Udiga of uh, Udogi of uh, uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Now, the sports from the public will be combined with those of a panel of football experts to decide the winner, who will be revealed on Saturday, 18th of May. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Former Nigeria's aviation minister Hadi Sirika has been granted bail over alleged 2.5 billion naira fraud. Human Rights Watch has warned of genocide in Sudan. We also told you that seven villagers have been killed in deadly rebel attack in DR Congo. I remember that you can send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number now showing on your screen. And as you do that, make sure to do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can always watch News Central live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Apple TV, and on YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Judith at TV.